Great. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, welcome on behalf of the Organic Trade Association in Canada. And we are excited today to uh, be joined by Amber Salego, and she is the Director of Science Programs at the Organic Center in the United States, and um, very happy to have her with us today. Uh, today's webinar we are recording, and we will be distributing after the fact to all the participants, so you don't need to scribble down and um, make all sorts of uh, slide notes, etc. We're going to distribute this after the fact. Uh, we're going to go for about an hour today, and um, very happy to uh, make sure that we take all your questions at the end. If you'd like, what you can do is um, you can enter your questions into the chat uh, to everyone. And at the end of the session, we will um, let every, we'll do a question and answer. So um, if we could go on to the next slide, Amber. And I just want to acknowledge that, um, you know, my name is Teal Lofsgaard. I'm the executive director here at the Canada Organic Trade Association. We're based in Ottawa, which is the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin uh, Nation. And their time, of course, reaches back to time immemorial. So just to highlight our connection to the land and to the peoples here. On to the next slide, please. And we're happy to be hosting this uh, presentation, of course. Um, we are the not-for-profit National Industry Association for the organic sector here in Canada. And just to kind of highlight, of course, if you haven't heard of us, because we have participants from all over the world here today, uh, we've got, of course, uh, several areas of strategic focus. We do focus on market access and development. We do put together a lot of industry intelligence with a really awesome new 2024 organic market report if you haven't seen it for Canada. We do of course a lot of public advocacy for the sector and we do regulatory affairs. Um, and in addition to this, we also run all the organic month uh, programming on behalf of the sector. So um, we just wrap that up in September and uh, put it on your calendar for next year because it's every single September. So you can go on to the next slide, Amber. And so it is my privilege to be able to introduce Amber. And Amber, as mentioned, she's the Director of Science Programs at the Organic Center, where she leads organic agriculture research and communicates the findings to consumers. And I can tell you, we use tons of this research all the time in all the work that we do. With 15 years in the organic industry, she collaborates with researchers, farmers, policymakers to identify and address organic research needs. Dr. Salego has developed a range of research programs to enhance her organic farming systems and lead science communication efforts, including reports, webinars, and social media. She holds a PhD in ecology and evolution from Lincoln University, New Zealand, with expertise in plant insect interactions and sustainable farming practices. So thank you so much, Amber, for joining us here today. And we are gonna have more people entering. I keep letting more people in. So we're gonna kick it off and, um, and enjoy the show, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much, Tia. And I just want to thank everybody else for joining today. Um, I think it's been a while since um, the Organic Center has done an update for, for CODA. And so I'm excited to share with you all um, some of the work that we've been up to um, and in our efforts to help simultaneously boost the organic supply as well as consumer demand for organic and we do this, um, as mentioned in my bio, through science-backed education. Uh, today, I'm going to go through several of our information products and just show you all how you can use our work as a resource. And then I'll highlight some of the what I believe is compelling research uh, that we're involved in currently, but also some that we'll be ramping up in the new year of 2025. So it's kind of a here's who we are, what we're doing, where we're at and where we're going kind of uh, presentation today. And hopefully you'll find some, um, some information here that'll be useful for you. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Organic Center or if you need a refresher course, um, our organization is a nonprofit organization. We're based in Washington, DC. We do share an office with the Organic Trade Association and we also work under the administration of OTA. Uh, a lot of times people refer to us as their sister organization or the science branch of OTA, um, but we are, in fact, separate legal entities. At the center, our mission is to conduct and convene evidence-based science on the, 
on the environmental and health effects of organic food and farming, and to also communicate those findings to the public. So we work across uh, the whole sector. We work collectively with stakeholders um, from industry, from farmers, scientists, uh, policymakers, um, other NGOs, advocates, all to help advance organic by facilitating research and developing resources that will help promote the benefits of organic and really communicate uh, the difference that organic makes to consumers. <clears throat> so we have four activities, um, or we have we have our activities fall into these four major categories or buckets: um, build communities, support industry advancement, as I've mentioned and will mention a million times in this presentation, communicate the benefits of organic to consumers, and fill fill knowledge gaps. And I'll focus mostly on the um, those top two buckets there, but specifically. The activities that we engage in to um, achieve our mission include a lot. Um, so I'll just run through some of these here, but we develop partnerships and engagement opportunities with universities and other research institutions, with federal agencies and organic farmers and other food system advocates, everyone basically who's working to improve and transform our agricultural system. We help foster alliances among funding entities, other nonprofits, government agencies, um, as well as international bodies uh, to help advance research on organic systems. We facilitate and participate in research that will um, fill these knowledge gaps about specifically health and environmental impacts of organic farming, and also to increase the viability and sustainability of the US agriculture system. We uh, empower consumers to make choices that will improve their health, as well as the health of the environment and the health of their communities through uh, education and outreach efforts. We serve as a resource for the public, which includes policymakers, and then all these other stakeholders that I continue to mention, like scientists and farmers and industry on the science uh, that's supporting sustainable organic food and farming. And we, we aim to strengthen and expand organic practices and commodities that will reduce the use of toxic synthetic chemicals, which obviously has clear benefits to human health and the environment. So I wanna spend just a few minutes on uh, why we do what we do. And it really starts with the organic opportunity, which is quite large in the US. Uh, what you see here is data from the most recent organic market analysis conducted by OTA. Um, and from that analysis, we know that the growth of the overall food market in the U.S. has remained relatively level. Um, however, the growth of the organic market continues at a steady pace. So you can see back here 10 years ago in 2014, um, the U.S. domestic organic sales were at 32 billion U.S. dollars. And after just 10 years, we've uh, those sales have more than doubled and are at nearly 70 billion US dollars. The gray bars here are predictions of future growth based on historical growth. And we anticipate that sales will exceed 80 billion US dollars in the next five years. Um, so really this is now a significant market opportunity for stakeholders across the value chain. When we look at uh, OTA's most recent consumer perception study, we see that consumers are most familiar with the term organic, as well as natural and local claims um, that fall close behind. And we also see that consumers mostly agree that organic products are healthier and uh, more nutritious. And for these qualities, they are most willing to pay higher premiums. Um, yeah, based on these qualities. But there are uh, several attributes of organic that we aren't we aren't marketing quite as well or quite as widely. Um, and these are qualities that about 30% of consumers are willing to pay a premium for. And so those attributes include, you know, improved animal welfare, government enforcement and independent inspection, um, protecting natural resources and biodiversity reducing greenhouse gas emissions and regenerating soil health. 
So these are some untapped potential marketing opportunities. And if consumers just better understood these benefits, then um, they would be willing to pay higher organic premiums. Uh, so overall, uh, through the survey, we know that education is key and consumers who are very knowledgeable about the characteristics and attributes of organic will find organic more important when they're choosing the food that they buy and they will be willing to pay more for it. Those who know less about organic characteristics um, don't feel that organic is important and they aren't willing to pay a higher price for organic products, which is not surprising. So it just means that if we want to increase consumer demand for organic, then our advertising and promotion strategies um, will benefit from including education to the consumer about the benefits of organic claims. And that's really where we fit in with our mission to communicate science-backed benefits um, to consumers in the effort to empower them with the knowledge that they need to make informed decisions um, and we hope that they will choose organic when they do have that choice. So uh, I'll just spend a, a few more minutes here on how we communicate the organic difference to consumers. So when we're talking with consumers, we always try to remind them that organic is the only standard that is federally defined and certified and enforced. We also remind them what those rules mean when they buy an organic product. So <clears throat> like what you see here, organic means restricted use of pesticides and fertilizers. There are no GMO ingredients or seeds that are used um, in livestock production. There's no antibiotics, synthetic growth hormones, or slaughter byproducts that are allowed. In processed foods, there are no artificial flavors, colors, or preservatives. This one actually seems to get a lot of attention these days. Um, and then in the processing of dried products, no irradiation is allowed and sewage sludge cannot be applied to fields. I won't go over all these messages, but you can see here this wheel of sustainability that we co-created um, in collaboration with OTA that shows the benefits of organic as backed by scientific research that fall into these three main categories. So those that are good for the planet, those that are good for people and animals, and those that are good for business and communities. Um, this is largely how we used to talk about the stool, the three legs of the stool of sustainability, but um, just sort of revamped into a wheel, which uh, we seem to like at the center in the OTA. Uh, we have a lot of different kinds of information products um, that, sh that share the benefits of organic as backed by science. Um, I'm going to go into, I'll, I'll give you some examples of some of these, but just at a very high level, these include our recipes. We have microsites, which are just websites that are designated for each of the research projects that we partner with. We have educational videos, um, primarily whiteboard videos, and we will be expanding that whiteboard explainer video library substantially over the next two years. Um, we send out newsletters to our subscribers that give them the latest science and events, things that are happening in the organic space every month. And we host educational webinars that we uh, record and we make them freely available to the public. And then probably um, some of our more popular products include our reports. And um, I'll give you some examples of what those reports look like too. We have a database of over 600 peer-reviewed science articles uh, that's always growing. Um, and these articles are summarized into a language that's more relevant for consumers so that they better understand the message. This helps us bring science out um, from behind literacy and, and literal paywalls uh, that exist. We try to use as many of those science summaries as we can, in addition to uh, rounding up other science that's been published to develop our series of reports. And these reports are basically um, big science literature reviews that are written, again, in a more common language, but they're also graphically designed to help keep the attention of consumers. And we aim to put out, I'd say, one, two, three reports per year. That's a pretty prolific report if we get three out, but that's our aim. 
Um, and these reports will either focus on the benefits of a given uh, organic ingredient or some topical report like how organic practices can um, impact climate change. This year, for the first time, we will begin putting out tip sheet summaries of each of these reports that will highlight the most compelling benefits of organic for each of the report topics. This is an example of what you would find in one of our uh, benefits of an organic ingredients report. So this here is a selection of content from our most recent report on the benefits of organic produce. Um, and you can see here in the table of contents that the content includes what organic means specifically for produce, how organic produce is healthier and tastes better, um, the human health benefits of organic farming and produce, how organic farming reduces occupational exposure to pesticides, um, improving farmer and community health. Uh, it also includes how organic farming boosts ecosystem services, which ensures a steady production of healthy food. We also took some time in this report um, to re-explain to the public what an ecosystem service is and, and what that means. We also explained uh, how systemic pesticides work and how their mode of action makes it impossible to wash them off and why that's important for produce. We have environmental benefits of organic produce production in this report. And then um, always in these reports, we include the socioeconomic benefits of organic. In partnership with this report, we also published a produce wash guide so that people who don't always have access to organic produce will learn how to more effectively wash away common chemicals um, as, as backed by science. So we looked through the literature and found that different washing strategies actually don't have the same effectiveness for all produce types. So for instance, um, stone fruit like peaches, we found should just be peeled because there's no washing method that is very effective for, for removing the residues that are commonly used in stone fruit production. But on the other hand, for lettuce, um, a long rinse with tap water can be sufficient. So we wanted to um, put all of these different washing techniques into one place for, um, for consumers to have. And this product was designed so that it could just be printed and put out on, an, on a cupboard or a fridge or something so that they could just use it as a quick reference during food prep. Um, and as a side note, both of these, rep the report and the produce, produce wash guide have been extremely popular. Um, we just re released this last produce report and we've already had 6,500 views to date and counting. Um, in addition to the benefits of organic ingredients types of reports, we have topical reports that also discuss the benefits of organic broadly for a given topic. Um, so these are something, just the cover pages of some of these reports that we've put out in the past few years. We have one report um, that's on not just how the application of chemicals, uh, but also the manufacturing of agrochemicals will disproportionately impact impoverished people and communities of color. Um, and until we published our produce report recently, this was the most downloaded report of all of ours. We've also re released a report on how buying organic cotton can be one of the most important choices a consumer can make, um, how organic practices can mitigate and help farmers adapt to climate change, and how organic practices um, can help protect us against nitrogen pollution that's associated with uh, synthetic nitrogen fertilizer use. This is a point that we're always trying to hit home with consumers is getting an understanding of the impacts of um, using nitrogen fertilizer, which isn't doesn't seem as such as a scary um, chemical as some of the other pesticides. The last example that I'll show you here is our recipes. These are by far our most popular information products um, with consumers. And this is just a good example that shows a recipe at the bottom. This is just a short recipe for a tea 
And then at the top, we always have some sort of short blurb to um, highlight a benefit of an, or of an organic ingredient in the recipe. If we don't have science for any re uh, ingredients in that particular recipe, then we'll just use benefits of organic broadly. And uh, this year, we're going to start incorporating more organic 101 into, into these recipes, just helping people better understand what organic means. Um, but the goal is basically to expose consumers to helpful information about organic as they're learning to um, to use learning or using our um, recipes. Um, okay, so those were all examples of our latest information products that we use to communicate to consumers. Um, and in that, you know, we're hoping to build that demand for organic products by putting some integrity behind the claims as backed by science. But as I mentioned earlier, we also help build the supply of organic. And we do this by mostly by facilitating research that helps fill knowledge gaps for organic producers and businesses. So I'll just run through um, what that process looks like. We, we engage in research in a couple different ways, primarily a couple different ways. We don't tend to do research ourselves in-house. We're usually partnering with other research um, institutions and academics. So sometimes we, um, I don't, actually don't know if you can see my cursor. I don't think you can. Um, sometimes we'll be approached by research teams a bit later in the process. They've already developed a project and they want us to join in as communications partners, usually um, to expand their audience from their regional or local spaces to a national level. Um, but we also will start at the beginning of this process so that identify knowledge or identify gaps in our knowledge there at the top. When we engage with stakeholders through various events in person or virtual, we start to hear where there are these needs for research. We can pair that with other um, reports and, and assessments that have been done like OFRF, uh, the Organic Farming Research Foundation. Yeah, they put out a great needs assessment where they've uh, surveyed farmers to get us, organic farmers to get a sense of what kind of research would be useful. So we help identify these knowledge gaps and then we help bring together research teams by reaching out to our network of academics from across the country Usually the teams are um, are built from U.S.-based researchers, but sometimes when it's appropriate, we'll bring in folks from um, other countries as well. And then once we have our team put together, then we will all work to develop a project. We will often help them find funding, which is usually through federal grant applications, but sometimes it's um, a smaller project and we can uh, do a little camp a fundraising campaign and raise the funds privately. And then just depending on how we fit into that particular project, we might be really involved in the project management or we might not. We might mostly just be in as communications partners. But as the results come out of these research projects, we really try to leverage them and use them with other partnerships like with OTA to um, inform advocacy and policy asks. Um, and then we also try to uh, join in on any manuscript publications that come out of the work. So that's largely how we get involved with these research partnerships. We have, like I said, we've got these microsites for each of our projects that we're involved in. And if you go to the Our Work page on our website, you can click on each of these and it will it will give you a lot more information about each of the projects, including like who the research teams are, um, the objectives of the work. Um, if there are any resources that come out of it, like webinars, fact sheets, publications, um, other PowerPoint presentations, we will also include those in these in these microsites. So um, T had asked me to share some of the interesting research that we're that we're involved in right now. And so I thought I would just go through four notable projects um, that we're partnering with. And incidentally, all of them were federally funded. And I believe all of them were funded through 
the organic research, um, organic ag research and extension initiative, which is a USDA program that we just call OREI for short. So the first project that I'll mention uh, is about developing food safety tools and training for organic produce farms. This project is led by the University of Rhode Island. And the, the main goals for this project are to clarify the rules for food safety and organic regulations to organic certifiers, to food safety inspectors, um, other farm advisors and farmers. We are hoping that we can get everybody speaking the same language and on the same page so that everyone can understand where there are tension points when farmers are trying to comply with both sets of rules for food safety and the national organic um, standards. The team will focus primarily on the tensions around soil amendments and will um, conduct a series of needs assessments and surveys that will hopefully increase um, the understanding of the available organic soil amendments, as well as their associated food safety risks or the potential associated food safety risks. Uh, our role in this work will be to help develop a suite of outreach and educational materials. We'll be working with some other partners, um, OATS, which is the Organic Agronomy Training Service, as well as the Produce Safety Alliance to help us develop these tools. And then we will also be working with, um, with other farmer group leaders, um, maybe some top leaders at the Transition to Organic Partnerships programs. Man, I'm, I'm laying out all these acronyms right now. It's like alphabet soup. Hopefully I'm getting them all right. Um, but we'll be working with some top leaders to help develop 10 in-person um, regional workshops across the US uh, to help walk through these risk assessment tools, as well as the identification of where the tensions exist in the food safety and um, organic standard policies. The next project I'll mention is fostering sustainable organic cotton production through research and outreach. And this is led by Texas A&M University. Actually, the number of partners and people on the research team for this project is incredible given the size of the grant. Um, and I couldn't fit it all in a screenshot here for you. But the goals of this work are to help US organic cotton producers, it's a big domestic cotton focus here, but to help um, the US cotton producers improve their yields, their productivity and their sustainability in their existing fields, but they also wanna help farmers transition more acreage into organic production. And so that includes work um, that will help the researchers identify ways to reduce tillage intensity, um, but also improve weed control um, and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through the improvement of soil health. They want to help farmers minimize crop losses that are coming specifically from climate variability, and they will help generate new market opportunities for organic cotton that's been domestically grown. Another project that we're involved um, that we're involved with is about enhancing the efficacy of protective netting for climate and pest resilience. This is a project that's led by the University of Kentucky. Uh, and their major goals are to help advance organic fruit and vegetable production, primarily in the Southeast, um, but also in the Midwest and Northeast regions of the US by figuring out how to optimize the use of protective row covers. This is um, like a fine mesh netting that can exclude very small insects with the goal of in improving um, produce quality. So the researchers are hoping to figure out which vegetable crops will gain the most benefit from using these row covers. Um, they're looking to develop strategies to integrate these row covers into diversified vegetable rotations. And they're trying to address challenges um, with the implementation of these row covers. So for instance, uh, one, of the, one of the challenges that they're finding is that weeds can be a problem. So how do they best control weeds while using these row covers? Um, and how do they make these row covers more cost-effective for 
uh, these small, mid-size, and even large vegetable operations. The last partner uh, research project that I'll mention um, is on the impacts of orchard grazing on soil health, food safety, and pest control. And this is led by a team um, at the University of California, Davis. And the main goals of this project are to provide guidance on the risks and the benefits of livestock grazing of cover crops in organic nut orchards. They're hoping to use this information to remove barriers that currently exist. Um, some of those are cultural barriers, some of them are political or policy barriers um, that we have, especially in California, to the expansion of livestock integration in orchard cropping systems. But they also want to do this in a way that um, will ensure that food safety is being maintained. So some of the work that they're doing aims to determine how livestock integration does impact food safety risks, but also how does it improve or impact soil health. They want to learn um, whether sheep grazing can help manage common pests of tree nuts, which I think is a really compelling part of this work. And then of course, you know, try to understand the economic feasibility of incorporating livestock for grazing into orchard crops. Um, in California. And I think the nuts that they're focusing on are walnuts, almonds, and they're still trying to recruit some pistachio farmers, I believe. Okay, so the last current research project that I'll mention um, is one that's actually led by OTA and is a partnership with uh, the Organic Center. Um, this was funded by a one-off USDA pocket of money called the Organic Market Development Grant. We're hoping that some future advocacy will result in a more permanent line item for this grant funding in future farm bills. But for now, at least, uh, the U.S. government has recognized that uh, to support farmers that are transitioning to organic, we have to also grow that demand and the infrastructure to improve the market for organic products. Um, so they created this grant and devoted $85 million to over 90 projects that will help build capacity from farm to the table. So that includes equipment for processing and distribution, um, as well as market promotion, which is where we come in. So OTA and the Organic Center won $2.2 million that we will match to develop marketing materials that will promote uh, the benefits of organic as backed by science to consumers. Um, it's doing what we do already, but it's helping us expand this into different regions and markets um, and communities than we have been able to do in the past. So our uh, advertising and promotion efforts will aim to increase organic markets in the areas of the US where there is less organic farming. And that's indicated on this map by the color blue. These are um, this is the hot spots work and it shows the red spots on this map are places where there is a lot of organic farming and, um, and operations and the blue is where there are not um, as many. So we'll be focusing our efforts primarily in the southeast, but also in some other regions. And um, we'll also be focusing on minority consumer communities as well as some pinpoint commodities like small grains uh, dairy and fiber crops. So what's next? Um, we do have a lot of exciting programming uh, as well as information products and research to look forward to in 2025 and beyond. We have a few reports that are planned. Uh, the next two that will come out uh, will be, we'll, we'll start with a second report on organic or it's, not on, it's on conventional cotton, which is titled Pesticide, Fertilizer, and Genetic Modification Use in Conventional Cotton in the U.S. and Globally. This actually will be coming out next week, so um, keep your eyes peeled for that report. And then as an extension to our um, 2023 conference on plastic reduction, we will put out a, a report that will focus on the solutions to reducing plastic along the, um, the entire organic supply chain. 
We have a lot of events always. We're always involved in events as speakers, um, but we also will host or co-host events. And so some that are coming up that are exciting for us um, is one that we're co-hosting. <clears throat> it's a conference that we're co-hosting in partnership with Tuskegee University, um, the Foundation for Food and Ag Research, Cliff Bar, and the Professional Ag Workers Conference in Alabama. And this event is uh, called Cultivating the Future of Organic Agriculture in the Southeastern U.S., um, How Advancing Equity and Inclusion Will Strengthen the Organic Movement. Um, this will be an invite-only um, event that's really focused on um, boosting resources and networking for researchers and extension and farmers and community members um, in and around historically Black colleges and universities. We have um, also uh, coming up an organic night out uh, honoring this year's best in organic. This will be done in partnership or in conjunction, I mean, with the Natural Products Expo West on March 5th, um, 2025, next year in Anaheim. Um, this is an event where uh, some of you know, this is also our annual fundraiser event uh, that has taken different forms over the years, but I feel like we've landed on this really fun um, and exciting format now. So uh, with this event, we are trying to really celebrate, like have a big celebration of the achievement of various organic brands and companies um, and celebrate the ways that they are communicating, educating, and advocating about the benefits of organic. So at this event, we'll give out a series of awards for several categories um, that include best new organic uh, food or beverage, best new organic non-food product, um, best organic messaging, most impactful research results, um, emerging organic brand of the year, and organic company of the year. I believe we're going to be soliciting nominations soon. So again, keep your eyes peeled because we would love for you to consider putting your names in the hat or um, giving us other names to consider. Um, and then also, of course, you know, as this is our annual fundraiser event, um, this is the second year that we're doing this fundraising in partnership uh, with Organic Voices. So sponsorship will support both of these organizations which really is the advancement of um, organic science and its communication to consumers. So if any of you are interested in learning more about sponsorship and getting a seat um, at this event, just reach out to me and I will put you in touch with the right people. Okay, so some upcoming research <clears throat> and education programs that we have. We, we have about um, around 15 active research projects right now. And we are, we've just launched three of them, but really they'll be, uh, these that I'm mentioning are going to be really ramping up starting in 2025. And all of them revolve around this theme of training the next generation of organic leaders and really having a focus on um, increasing justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the organic sector. So um, we received an OREI curriculum grant, which is the first time that we've had, that we've received this kind of uh, grant type from OREI. We're also the leads of this project, though we're partnering with um, the University of Texas at Rio Grande Valley. And this project uh, aims to develop culturally relevant organic curriculum, professional development, and experiential learning opportunities. We'll again have a focus um, of increasing JEDI in, in organic through these activities. We will also be working with the same university, uh, not as a lead for this project, but another project that will continue to work on expanding that organic curriculum development, as well as internships and experiential learning um, in organic agriculture. And this will be um, as a training and workforce development initiative that's specific to the University of Texas at Rio Grande Valley. The first project I mentioned um, will be focused more broadly on minority serving institutions across the US. And then finally, in our partnership with FAR or the Foundation for Food and Ag Research, uh, we will be 
mapping out research resources. Uh, and that is a, a that's <laughs> with lots of different categories or types of, of resources that are included in that. But we're hoping to be able to increase networking, um, collaboration, effective research development, um, and funding acquisition. Um, and again, we're doing this with a focus on increasing JEDI and organic. So we're starting with minority serving institutions, um, particularly uh, historically black colleges and universities in the southeastern US, but we're planning on expanding this um, as much as we can um, with funding permitted. So I think, yeah. I think this is all that I have for you. I threw a lot at you for our programming, um, but if you have any questions, I'd, I'd love to answer those. And Tia, I don't know if you want me to stop sharing the screen. Um, yeah, then we can actually see you, but let's leave it up there first. Well, people oh, hopefully got, hopefully they got your, uh, your contact details. <laughs> um, I can That's also, just, I'll put that in the chat really fast too. Yeah. That'd be super great. Awesome. Great. And for those that um, entered the webinar a little bit late, we are recording this and we're going to distribute a copy of the slides and, and the, um, the recording. So, but we do have a few minutes now um, to take any questions that people have. If you would like, I think we've got um, everybody muted. So you're going to have to write your questions into the chat or into the, yeah, the little meeting chat uh, directed to everyone. Um, I will ask a question because I always have questions. Um, so you mentioned that you don't usually do the, the research in-house. You're partnering with academic institutions. You mentioned sometimes you actually um, are working with overseas partners, it sounds like, or, or other countries. Maybe speak to um, some of those projects. And then, of course, you know I'm going to ask if you've collaborated with Canada in any of these ones. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll start out by saying um, not in my tenure so far at the center have we collaborated with Canada, but super open to doing so, right? Um, I think mm -hmm. we've even had some conversations with you, Tia, about expanding some of the hot spots, cold spots work, mm -hmm. um, which I think would be a great opportunity. Um, yeah, so we... One thing that I didn't cover too much of, um, in addition, that's not really answering your question, but we also, f we do fund research. So we have this partnership with the Foundation for Food and Ag Research, um, and that has allowed us to offer each year about $1 million um, towards research, organic research and education projects. And those are all, that's done through like a, um, a competitive application process. Okay. And, we, and we basically administer administer that. That pr program is what has now evolved into this new direction of mapping out resources, uh, research resources um, in starting in the South. Um, so we won't be running that competitive uh, that competitive call uh, application process this next year. Um, but we, Normally when we work with international partners, I'll give one example. It's it's often like try, building these research teams, right, to, to address a topic. We put in a grant proposal that was not funded um, last year for ORAI, but I believe we'll be resubmitting it. And that was working in partnership with some universities in the U.S., but also with a university in South Africa where we were trying to create these knowledge exchange opportunities so we were trying to get funding to, um, one, develop some uh, curriculum opportunity, uh, new curriculum, um, professional development opportunities for students and faculty, and actually have like the conference funding, right, to host um, events where we could bring in farmers and researchers and experts from South Africa, bring them to a place in the South and vice versa. So um yeah, creating some knowledge exchange events was the main one there. But yeah. um, what I would like to do is identify more opportunities where we can potentially build off of existing research. Um, so for instance, the EU has has a lot of great research and particularly TP Organics out of um, an iPhone EU. They're involved in some, some really... Um, 
some really robust research programs that we can learn a lot from so that we're not starting from scratch if we wanted to do similar things. Um, mm -hmm. One of those projects that we're interested in is the expansion of organic into school um, school meals. And so okay. we'd love to learn a little bit more of the work that comes out of that so we can start applying it um, to work that we have with partners in the U.S. that are trying to do this. Awesome. Well, I've got too many other things I want to say, but please, people, um, put your questions there. I'll keep talking in the meantime. Um, of course, we run an organic campus program here in Canada, and it is about um, changing the procurement policies of uh, academic institutions in Canada. So everything from a CEGEP in Quebec all the way through to colleges and universities. And there has been an emphasis in Canada on um school food programming through the national food policy. So that's an area that we're involved in. So let's keep in touch on that one. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, the executive director of IFOM International, and for anybody who doesn't know all our acronyms, <laughs> it's the International Federation of the Organic Agricultural Movement. So IFOM International, um, he will be coming to Canada and I'm setting up a series of meetings for him to re to meet with uh, some of our academic institutions, which is the International Development Research Center. So I think there's a real opportunity for more knowledge exchange going on, because I think there's certainly Canadian institutions um, at the Crown Corporation level, um, semi-government, that are really looking at uh, the agroecological practices, etc. And we haven't done enough connecting with them, I would say you know, mm. in Canada. So, you know, as we kind of pursue um, those conversations with those semi-government institutions, we'll keep in touch. But the other question I have for you is um, in Canada, we have the Organic Agricultural Sci Sci Science Center, OACC Center. I don't know what the second C stands for. <laughs> like I OACC. Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, wonderful, um, a wonderful program run out of Dalhousie University, but really it's a collaboration that runs the organic science cluster for Canada, and they just got a boatload more money to do organic science cluster um, um, research projects, and I believe there's over 60 academic researcher partners in Canada. Mm. So this is where, you know, our findings, I think, could be shared through the organic center, because Yes. Nobody wants to start from scratch on creating what this beautiful resource that should be a North American resource for everybody. Um, the only limitation for us is that it's only in English, which we would love everything to be bilingual, I'm sure. But um, even having a place where everybody can go to and then we can deal with translation, I think that's um, that's a good thing. But yeah, I think it'd be really interesting to kind of strengthen that um, exchange and and continue to see how we can get more relevant research out there because the number one thing that we always hear when we're in discussions with government and politicians is they want to use science science backed results and it is difficult when we do not have canadian examples so mm -hmm. this is where um i do look through and i have used your research i've used rodale institute's research many times and um it's proves exactly why we're advocating for more organic production supports and, and uh, policies in Canada. So. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of great points that I just want, I want to address um, that you just mentioned. One, you know, we, uh, for the policymaker side of things, wanting science to back things up, we also struggle to find enough examples from the U S we rely a lot actually um, on especially European science, partly because they've been um, they've been doing it for longer, right? Not necessarily organic farming um, or even science research on organic, but organic as it's defined, like federally mm -hmm. defined, right? Um, and so certified organic is like a newer thing in the US. And so we don't have as much of a of a robust body of science. And so, we're always trying to advocate and with the OTA, their advocation for, or advocacy for more funding for more research um, in the US is really helpful. So I hear you um, on that. Um, I would love for us to find ways to um, promote more of the science that's coming out of Canada too. Um, mm -hmm. 
for the languages also for us, it's an issue. And like this uh, organic market development grant opportunity is allowing us to put resources into the translation of a lot of our products into other languages. So we're going to, I should have mentioned this before, as I say, go to our website and use all of these things for resources. We will be totally revamping our website. <laughs> We're going to get a whole new look and feel um, and hopefully a lot a lot more usability um, out of it or make it more user-friendly. Um, but one of the things that we're doing is we will have uh, we will have our website available in multiple languages. Um, we still will have to translate our products, like anything that's a PDF that has to be downloaded. So we're starting with Spanish. Um, we'll work our way through there, um, through, through all of our products with Spanish, and then move on to other languages. I'm guessing like your language, your preferred language would be French. French. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, that's definitely on our radar too. And yeah. with more funding, we will continue to keep translating our, our products into other languages. Good. I'm sure my francophone, uh, participants will be very happy to hear and I'm also you know apologize that we can't offer this um this event in bilingual um it's it's one of the things that we try to address as much as we can but uh, it's limited especially when our speakers and we don't have simultaneous translations so but doing the best we can here so if we don't have any more questions I just want to thank you Amber for joining us here today and um it's always fascinating. And I do encourage anybody who hasn't visited the Organic Center, can you just type in the, the website there? Because I'm sure we're going to get a bunch of hits on your website as soon as you do that. <laughs> um, honestly, you can put in um, nutrition, you can put in climate, you can put in insects, you can put in any kind of keyword, and it's going to, it's going to give you back exactly what you're looking for. So I really encourage people, if you have never heard of the Organic Center, and you've never used the research, please take a peek at it. And, um, you know, let's all work together on bringing more science uh, together. So thank right. you so much, Amber. Appreciate thank you coming. You. And thank you everybody for attending Bye. today. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.